What is up, down and sideways, all you beautiful individuals? Welcome back to League Unlock. Another day, another opportunity for a Western squad to make some impact, make it competitive on the international stage at MSI. Day two of that main stage best of five bracket. Fanatic obviously run through the playing stage, so they are all freshly warmed up going up against the top seed from the LCK, yet to make their tournament debut in Gen G. And to the surprise of absolutely nobody, right away, Fnatic showing up in a much more competitive way than we got out of Team Liquid or FlyQuest so far in their matchups against the LCK and LPL, respectively, going right into this series. And... Always looking for something in terms of pick band, something spicy. We've seen Oscar in and pop off on the Camille in the playing stage. He gets to pilot it this time again. We're getting a roll swap or lane swap, excuse me, early on, partially to avoid that Varus Ash combo out of Fnatic, as well as shut down the Camille, but it didn't matter because eventually the 2v2 came through and it was the Fnatic bot lane actually showing up, even though that flash from Noah is not really doing a whole lot. Eventually, Humanoid comes in on the Talia to clean things up. The problem is at the end of this, Chovy shows up with a TP of his own to, uh, Get things rolling a little bit as this Chovy, uh, this Corky, excuse me, would eventually get way out of control. Despite him walking face first into an arrow from Jun and eventually going down, Fnatic was, was definitely going toe to toe with Gen G. They had the dragon advantages and uh, I believe already basically getting more dragons than Team Liquid did their entire series against top esports. But unfortunately, eventually we do Get a good Rumble ulti equalizer out of Lahens. Chovy there to clean it up as well. The clean, keen Sante ulti onto Noah as soon as he flashes. Uh, even though eventually Razor gets in to contest this Baron. He does not get it. He got the Fatality Callista. I think the Baron got down to 34 HP. And then it's just a bonus kill on Oscar Rinnan at the end of that for Gen G to slowly but surely close out that first game. It does end up being uh, a sub 30 minute one, but still, there was moments where Fnatic was in the driver's seat. There were moments where they were in, I'm not going to say in control of the game, but at least putting pressure on Gen G, not rolling over and sliding into the second game because. Some positives that you can go off of if you are Fnatic. And game two is where Gen.G starts cooking up a little bit in the draft. We saw Team Liquid steal the Nami away from Lucian against Top Esports and paired it with the Jin to the absolute head scratchingness to everyone else seeing that happen. Gen.G does one better. They say we're going to steal the Nami and we're going to pair it with a Draven alongside the pocket pick. Kha'Zix for Cannon. Canyon rearing its ugly head. He grabs first blood and then the maximum disrespect. Evolving his Q in front of Razork. I don't know if that was a misclick or a full BM because that's that's even more hardcore than spamming emotes. It's doing an evolve into the face. But uh, Pays in the hands, feeling confident going forward as Canyon shows up again. He had an immaculate early game just like he did on the bug against T1 in the LCK Finals. It was the mid game that did not go so well for Mr. Canyon as get ready to watch a highlight reel of him getting caught out. Yes, it forces an ulti out of the Orianna, but multiple times Canyon gets caught out, forcing Gen.G into a 4v5 scenario. The problem for Fnatic and EU fans around the globe, apparently that's where Gen.G thrives. Multiple fights, Chovy on this Aurelian Soul alongside Pays. There's just no access to get past Keen Sante again in this game too as the carries go untouched, but no bear for Fnatic. And again, Canyon, where's he going? He's all alone, getting blown up by Humanoid and crew, getting caught out 11 to nine and kills for Fnatic. But again, it's that 4v5 this time. They're actually able to secure the Baron and Fnatic kind of closes this gold lead, makes things even again. But once Canyon 
does not get caught out into a fight. Now we are 40 minutes into this game. That means the A Soul is fully online. Pays yet to die even in this match on uh, Draven, and he's got so much cash in money. Look at how confidently, maybe a little too confidently, he just walks into the Baron Pit, blows up Razork before he can do anything. Uh, Chobi is just spinning around, breathing super hot fire, as finally Genji does close this one out. But you saw six dragons, a 45-minute game, uh, Baron's going over to the way of Fnatic. That was, that was a game that maybe... Just maybe you're talking about Fnatic coming away with the win because there was a lot of uncharacteristic mistakes out of Gen G and specifically, again, Canyon on that Kha'Zix who looked so ready to snowball this game out of control and be done and dusted with it. When I think he was 2-0 and 2 at one point and then get up going 2-4 and 2, just kind of dying over and over again, but not enough. Uh, for Gen G as or not enough for Fnatic, excuse me, as Gen G comes away with the win. So we head into that third one. Fnatic still feeling good. Maybe like they should have won game two because they came out of the gate swinging in game three. It was another lane swap because you had Keen's vain top being inspired by Zeus in that LCK split and uh, some crazy dives scored around multiple spots as Oscar Innan actually did a great job surviving early in these lane swaps, but it was Humanoid running around getting kills getting ahead in this one, even though he's going to get ganked by the classic roaming keen vein. He was doing this at level one. He's doing it at level seven here as Humanoid does get shut down. But there was, this was the scrappiest game of the series by far. This is where Fnatic is at their absolute best when they're just small skirmishes all over the place. Humanoid roaming around the map like an absolute mad lad. He truly had some vendetta against Lahens in this match. The poor little fish getting chased down by the LeBlanc. But we saw Humanoid do this against Top Esports, get incredibly fed on the LeBlanc. But the problem is he gets so fed. He's got these huge bounties and he's still playing like he's 0-0 hunting for kids. This is way too risky a play to go into get pays when you have such a big bounty as he gets shut down and then Chovy also follows up to clean up clean up two more kills going over to Gen G to kind of get things rolling in the favor of the LTK's top seed but Fnatic was holding tight they were still there as Humanoid hops in but you're blowing up the Nami who cares at that point as he gets blasted uh, by Pays grabbing another kill. Eventually, Chovy does get hopped on to, but look at Pays completely untouched. Everybody's ignoring him. Keen finally shows up on the vein to clean this fight up. They can't chase down Oscar Riddick because he's invincible, but there's Noah getting caught up by Canyon, who also somehow had a bounty at that, bounty at that point where Vettius immediately jinxed him. But it's a story kind of the same as game two. They can't get onto Chovy in so many of these pivotal fights. And this time there's an extra carry threat in that vein, just completely waiting to be unleashed. Scaling was fully on the side of Genji, despite having a Lucian on their squad. Humanoid, yes, he got fed, but as I mentioned, I think it was two, maybe even three times. He's serving up a bounty on a silver platter, getting a little bit too aggressive as kills go to the way of Genji. They able to close out game three in the fastest fashion. Once they got a lead, they were able to snowball it. As we've come to expect time and time again, not just from Genji, but many of these LCK and top tier teams around the league. So definitely um, game three playing the Fnatic playstyle. Honestly, surprising to see Gen G be able to scrap to that level like they did throughout these series, especially games two and three. We're so used to them playing calm, cool, clean League of Legends. It was anything but that in games two and three, but they still thrive in the chaos to get the 3 0, but a completely different type of 3 0 than what we've seen uh, out of, you know some of the NA teams so far at this uh, tournament. Now you compare Fnatic when you look at their first matchup against Top Esports, where they were able to take a win in the playing stage and have a competitive, at least one of the games that they lost to them. And now, yes, you're getting swept by Gen G, but a 45 minute banger in the second one. And even none of these games 
really got out of control where you saw Gen G ballooning to a 10, 15K gold lead, which we've seen uh, LPL and LCK teams do so often to some of the more, I I'm not going to call EU a minor region, but lesser powerful regions because everybody not from the LCK and LPL is lesser uh, by that standard. So still plenty of positives to talk about for Fnatic. Um, Oscar Innan doing okay. I mean, I know it was two Keen Sante games where he completely took over, but laning phase at the very least, he's getting better at lane swaps as that continues to develop throughout this tournament. Noah had another rough series, which is too bad because Jun was playing at a very high level. And there were moments where the 2v2 looked good for Fnatic, but a lot of these team fights, it was actually Pays stepping up over Noah. And this is this was kind of when we were doing 80 carry rankings, we were talking about Noah potentially being able to leapfrog over this slumping pace that we got from the LCK playoffs, but still not peak form out of pace, but definitely performed better, especially that Draven game. His positioning was pretty much immaculate uh, throughout. He piloted the Lucian pretty well in that third game. So definitely a level up from pace and a bit of a step down uh, for Noah. It's a tail, he seems to be playing so damn well against some of these lesser AD carries, but when he matches up against the truly world-class ones, he seems a little bit flustered, flashing into walls, spamming cullings, trying to avoid Draven ulties, not seeing that um, prowess that we saw out of him in EU. So with that, Fnatic heading down to the loser's bracket, Gen G moves on to face top esports eventually on that winner side of the msi bracket speaking of the losers side of things now we preview we look ahead to the classic na versus eu showdown you knew it's inevitable at this new look format in msi we're gonna get na versus eu it's probably gonna be in losers elimination do or die now we get fanatic versus team liquid and the real question is can Team Liquid wake up in any way, shape, or form? Can they have a competitive series against Fnatic? Because looking at the body of work so far at this MSI, you'd be insane to not pick Fnatic in this series. As I already highlighted, they've shown that they can actually provide pushback for teams like Gen G and Top Esports. Team Liquid had absolutely zero pushback against TES in their best of five. So unless there's a significant level up, I don't see how Team Liquid has taken down Fnatic. This does seem like a classic NA upsets EU when they have absolutely no reason to. But if you're looking at matchups across the board, I mean, the main highlight or strength so far has been the solo lanes for Team Liquid. But you're not giving APA an edge over Humanoid, especially when they have such even if they're not going to be banning out APA because Humanoid has such a similar champion pool to Leah, Aurelian Soul, you know, something he's looked incredibly comfortable on and probably even better than APA. So, you know, you ban out the Ziggs probably and then really feeling good about Humanoid in that matchup. Uh, Impact and Oscar Rinnan. Lane swap, who can do it better if that's going to end up being the case? Although Team Liquid, they didn't look super comfortable playing out these uh, lane swaps early on. Cough, cough, we think of that 2v2 from Yawn and Core JJ. Um, so, I mean, top lane, you're not given a huge advantage either way. The bot lane is really probably where this one comes down to, and as I mentioned too earlier, Noah, when he's playing against lower tier AD carries, looks like that premier LEC AD carry that we saw throughout the majority of the spring split, and I think Yawn falls under to that category. Despite both of these ADs kind of getting completely gapped and dumpstered by Jackie Love in that matchup, you still feel like Noah is at a much higher level, even though we had some whoopsie moments uh, matching up against Gen G today. It's, it seems like the nerves get the best of him. The bigger these matchups are or the higher stakes, maybe he feels like there's extra pressure that he has to perform at a high level when they're matching up against these big dog teams. He shouldn't feel that pressure against Team Liquid because Jan, as we mentioned, did not look so good against that TES one. So I think this is this is an opportunity for both Noah and Jun to have a bounce back performance. Maybe there's some step up from Jan and Core JJ, but I mean, truly, we've had such a small sample size of Team Liquid. It's really hard to gauge this, especially when you've got like 
seven plus extra games that Fnatic has played, but you can base it on both of these squats uh, went to head to head against top esports, ultimately lost. Fnatic performed much better, so they should be favorites. Do I have confidence that there's going to be any kind of level up from Team Liquid here? Nope, really, I don't. I mean, APA is still doing APA things in his interview, saying Fnatic will be much easier than Top Esports as an opponent. And yeah, they probably will, because Top Esports is a pretty damn difficult opponent. But that still does not give me any confidence that NA can come away with a, a series upset here against Fnatic. But really, we're just looking for competitive. If Team Liquid bows out in 03 fashion and they're not really in any of these games, this is the most disappointing, underwhelming, sad performance that NA has had internationally. If, listen, they've had some bad sticker performances. This might be the worst. Your only single series win or two wins coming against PSG before they get the redemption and destroy you uh, to qualify for the main stage. Team Liquid goes zero and six. Like there's not many positives. I don't even know what NA teams are learning from these events if they're getting completely bodied and gapped in all of these matchups. So you, you at least need something competitive out of Team Liquid, some signs of life, because we've already seen that multiple times out of Fnatic. This is a time to save kind of the expectation and the, I mean, it's not like there's much clout or excitement that NA has, but save something. Give a little bit shred of dignity for North America as a whole in this NA versus EU matchup uh, as things roll onwards in still round one of that bracket stage. We also got PLG versus PSG, which does not bode well for us snapping the streaks of three zeros early on. Uh, in this first round. I'm, I'm getting serious shades of what we got last year at MSI, which was um, squads definitely not up to the same level from EU and NA as the LCK and LPL people. I've seen people memeing that now the LCK and LPL play-in stage begins, which is absolutely what it's kind of feeling like. Um, I'm. It would be even more painful, or not painful, more sad, if PSG is the one, the only squad to get a win in this first round. Uh, I'm banking on G2 getting at least a dub against T1, but I think PSG is going to be completely outmatched. I know that's not a hot take whatsoever in this BLG matchup, but I don't think the streak of 3 0s is ending in that matchup. So we're banking on G2. Uh, picking up something against T1 to close out that first round of bracket stage action. We got to jump away from MSI for a little, little bit of off-season news in the LCS. We're already looking towards summer and worlds. Team Liquid, sure, they got one more round, but the LCS is done internationally. We always look forward, and we've got the memory of a goldfish. We forget about what happened at MSI and say, yeah, but worlds... We're going to level up. Summer split, we're going to level up because we got the GOAT top laner coming back. Dignitas Licorice. This was rumored a little while ago, but now making it official. A bit of a surprise that he's heading to Dig because it felt like they were really ready to build around Rich in that top lane. But obviously, we're very excited to see Licorice back on the LCS stage. And he says it himself in this announcement video. I was the best top laner in the LCS in summer. No reason I won't be again. And listen, he was the best top laner in summer, which is why it was an absolute tragedy that he didn't get a squad in spring. He's obviously on a young Dignitas roster with, with some potential, especially XU in the jungle. So excited to see Licorice, how he does stepping into that leadership type of role there were glimpses where we thought maybe dig could make some noise in playoffs they ultimately did not end up doing that but he is the international savior of the lcs is licorice is dignitas the team that's gonna somehow qualify for worlds and be the hope for na well probably not but excited to see licorice back maybe he can uh, be that savior. I thought he'd be going on to a better squad or a team that has 
more expectations, but I guess everyone was happy with how their top laners were playing out. But either way, he's returning. And the other little bit of top lane news, Mr. Sunday, the most casual retirement announcement you'll ever see. He just tweets, after 10 years, by the way, I'm done. My career's over. This is one of the most iconic top laners in the LCS. And of course, going all the way back to his MVP level days in the LCK, one of the few guys who was going head-to-head, toe-to-toe with peak MVP level SMEB in that 2015-2016 era of the LCK. So riding off into the sunset is Mr. Someday and truly uh, leveled up the LCS as an entire region for the, however, five plus years, 2017. This guy came in with Dignitas. So there's your, there's your segue from Dig Licorice to Dig Someday. Is Dignitas just churning out absolute Top tier, top lane talent. But uh, someday, if you want to look at his career, two different splits. The LCS era and the LCK era truly will go down as one of the best top laners in LCS history. When you're talking about the consistency that he had, especially on 100 Thieves ever since that team uh, came into the league in franchising. He was kind of the face of it when he was there for so long. So sad to see him uh, retiring, but excited to see Licorice as it's... I'm not going to call it a new era, but top lane is forever shifting. And Licorice, there might not be someday anymore in the league to contest with, but there's the new young kid in the block in Thanatos who's going to be making his LCS debut with Cloud9. That's the matchup to be looking for. And now Licorice, he's just trying to knock through, what's that, Golden Guardians, FlyQuest, Cloud9. He's now played on Dignitas for at least half of the teams in the league. We've seen this guy pilot, but exciting to see these top lane matchups. Just Thanatos and Licorice coming in makes that a whole lot more exciting top side to watch. You got the development of Sniper in that top lane. Of course, Big Daddy Impact, who's going to have the performance of his life against Fnatic to lead Team Liquid to a victory, which completely contradicts everything I was just saying about TL. But top lane, low key, one of the most exciting roles to be looking at for 2024 in the summer split of the LCS. But that is it today for League Unlocked. My name is Eric. Thank you all you beautiful people for hanging out as always and continue to enjoy the madness of MSI 2024. And we will catch you on that flippity flip.